Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be back with you once again. Uh, It's Friday the 13th, which some people have superstitions about. I usually remember like halfway through the day that it's Friday the 13th. (laughs) Um, But today I remembered in the morning, kind of. Not that it mattered. I'm not usually very superstitious about it. It's more like one of those things where I think, oh, it's Friday the 13th. But I did ask a friend, are they superstitious about Friday the 13th here in Portugal? And she said, yes, to a certain extent, but mm, they have some superstitions, but mm, she said not, not in a huge way. So I didn't really talk to anybody else today, but I asked her over Facebook Messenger. So I cannot answer the question any in any more detail than that uh, they, yes they do have some superstitions around that day and date combination but i can't give you a whole lot more information i've never had anything really creepy happen on friday the 13th i don't know if you have if you have hit me up on social media share those experiences with me I can't say I would love to hear them because you know me and horror, we're not the best of friends, but you know, a certain level of of creepitude I'm good with. And uh, if it's, especially if it's kind of a funny story, I will definitely hear that. (laughs) But if you think it's an interesting story that will not cause me to be awake for the next two weeks, I would love to hear it. Anyway, I hope you've been having a good week and a good January so far. I think I mentioned that our nephew was coming to visit. He was um, our first visitor to come here and, and stay with us, so that was fun. We just we had a really good time, and hopefully he had a really good time, but we then, of course, got way behind because we were too busy playing and entertaining him while he was here, and so this week we've been playing a lot of catch-up, but... Um, hopefully we'll get a little downtime this weekend. We shall see. At any rate, as you know, we are here to talk about books. And today I have author Donna Gordon joining me to talk about her book, What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me. Uh, And let me give you the description from that book. What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me explores the story of Lee, a vibrant 13-year-old boy who is facing premature death from progeria, a premature aging disease. His caretaker, Tomas, a survivor of Argentina's dirty war, who is searching for his missing wife, who was pregnant when they were both disappeared, and Lee's single mother, Cass, overwhelmed by love for her son and the demands of her work as a Broadway makeup artist. When a mix-up prevents Cass from taking Lee on his final wish trip to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia to pursue his interest in the life of Ben Franklin, Tomas, who has discovered potential leads to his family in both cities, offers to accompany Lee on the trip. As one flees memories of death and the other hurdles inevitably toward it, they each share unsettling truths and find themselves transformed in the process. Set during the Ronald Reagan presidency, this lyrical novel transcends an adventure story to take the reader on an unforgettable journey. And so that is the description of what Ben Franklin would have told me. Lee is 13 in the book, and he loves American history, and he kind of idolizes Ben Franklin, so the title is appropriate. He and Tomas develop a it's an uneasy relationship at first, but... Um, it, it grows into a friendship. Lee is literally an old soul. I mean, he has the disease that is prematurely aging him, but he's also an old soul kind of in how he thinks and looks at the world. And he comes at it from a, 
a deeper perspective than some adolescent boys might, mainly because of the disease that he knows is limiting his time. And so he's just this very sweet, very quirky, very interesting character. And he and Tomas are, of course, very different in size, disposition, background, but they do end up forming this relationship on the trip that they take to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. And it's this very sweet kind of relationship that that flows from an adventure that Lee was not expecting to have. So I'm going to let Donna tell you more about the book, of course. Again, it is called What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me, and the author is Donna Gordon. Let's go ahead and go to that interview. Hey, Sarah, so great to talk to you. Thanks for having you here, and we're going to talk about your book, what Ben Franklin would have told me. But before we do that, if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you. Sure. I I live in Cambridge, Mass. This is my debut novel. Um, I wrote another novel that I haven't published yet, but um, I have a background in poetry writing. I, I went to Brown undergraduate and I wrote a lot of poetry there. And then after that, my um, sentences got longer and I started writing prose, but my uh, prose is sort of um, focuses a lot on language and the details of descriptive language. Um, I was a Stegner fellow at Stanford and that really sort of launched my um, prose writing career. And then I, um, um, I was a pen discovery in Boston and also a plowshares discovery and then I had children and that sort of slowed down my writing career for a number of years. So now at the age of 65, this is my first published novel. And I encourage everyone out there who believes in writing and, and wants to do it to just keep going and and um, believe in themselves. Well, that is, that's a wonderful accomplishment in addition to you know everything else that I'm sure you've also accomplished, but congratulations on the debut novel. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, It sounds like when it comes to writing, you kind of like to play with words and how they fit together. Uh, Poetry, I often think of as how words kind of fit together and sound together. And then it's and your prose is a little bit of the same. Would you say that's kind of accurate? Yeah, I would say so. I think I learned uh, through poetry writing to really sort of craft my sentences and to um, try to be accurate with metaphor and simile. And I always keep in mind a line um, from Rilke that I read while I was earlier in my career. And Rilke had said about language to ruthlessly compress. And that idea of um, trying to eliminate wasted words was a real guide for me in terms of my poetry writing as well as the prose. And I did revise my novel, What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me, from start to finish a few times, paying attention, not just to the story, but to the language. Oh, wow. Um, well, let's let's actually turn our focus to the novel. Can you give an overview of the story? Sure. Um, what Ben Franklin would have told me, uh, it's a literary novel and it follows the adventures of Lee, who's a 12 year old boy afflicted with progeria. Progeria is a premature aging disease so that um, his body ages at an accelerated rate and people who have progeria often don't live past the age of 15 or so. Um, Although there's new research now that's uh, prolonging lives. And Lee is um, paired with a caretaker named Tomas, who is a former political prisoner and a survivor of Argentina's dirty war. And together, they go on a journey to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia to look for Tomas's missing wife and child. Tomas's um, wife, Violetta, was imprisoned in a different prison in Buenos Aires um, when Tomas was abducted. And um, he has no, he doesn't know where to find her. And then he receives word that she may be in the Washington, D.C. area. So, um, Lee also has a single mother, Cass, who's a makeup artist for Off-Broadway, and he has a pet, a pot-bellied pig named Patrick. And um, Lee is an American history buff and a Ben Franklin fan, 
And so his um, his best friend, Kira, has just died of progeria in the early part of the novel. And so um, his mother, Cass, was supposed to take them on this wish trip to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. But the last minute she can't. So she asked Lee's caretaker, Tomas, to take Lee on the journey. And once there, Tomas reveals to Lee that he has an ulterior motive for being there and that he has reason to believe his missing wife and child have relocated there. So together they go on a uh, sort of a detective journey to try to find the missing wife and child. Which works out pretty well because Lee up to this point has been trying to figure out what Tomas's secrets are. He, he, he's convinced he has secrets and he he's thinking of himself already a little bit as a detective. So this fits right into his view of himself at the moment. You're right. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah. What was your initial inspiration for the story? Well, there were two very specific things that I experienced that um, that drew me to write the novel. The first one was I had volunteered at a camp called Camp Sunshine in Sebago, Maine. And the camp is for kids who have life-threatening illnesses and their families, and they're hosted for a week free of charge. And I had been asked by a friend to come and photograph some of the kids. And once I got there, I did see a boy who had progeria. It was the first time I had ever seen that disease, you know, anyone afflicted with that disease. And I never actually spoke with him, but the image of him stayed in my mind. And around the same time, I had done a volunteer project with Amnesty International for which I interviewed and photographed 15 people on their speakers list. And these people were from all over the world. But when I met them, they were living in the U.S. in various areas. And they had all been um, imprisoned, tortured, under house arrest, various um, uh, abuses like that. Um, and so I had met with them individually and interviewed them and photographed them. And two of the people I met were from Argentina and one of whom had been among the disappeared. He was a journalist and he had been released. So a lot of their stories um, stayed with me. And I'd say that this, the image of Lee was primarily on my mind. And then somehow I paired him with this fictional character, Tomas, and put them in a room in my mind and then the story began to grow. And I think the link between the two characters had something to do with time. For Lee, it was accelerated time and, and aging quickly. And for Tomas, it was lost time and how much he had lost. And when he was released, he he sort of was clueless about where to pick up and begin again with his life. So um, once I established that it was going to be a journey story, it was a lot easier to um, to move them along. Um, but that that was really the origin of the story, those two experiences. Okay, so now that you know a little bit more about the story and some of the characters, we're going to go ahead and take our first break of this episode. When we come back, we'll talk more about why Donna set this book during the 80s. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Donna Gordon about her debut novel, What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me. Let's go ahead and return to the interview. 
And because of Tomas's history um, within Argentina, is that why you then chose this, the, the time setting for the book? Um, because it's not current, obviously. Um, Tomas would be much, much older. Um, so was that a factor in choosing when it was set? It was definitely a factor. The book is set during the Reagan era in the early 80s. And the reason is that um, the Dirty War took place in Argentina between 1976 and 83 under the dictatorship of Jorge Videla. And so in order to have the story make sense, and it needed to be set during that time, there's a lot more that's known about progeria today than there was at the time. And there's a lot there's a lot more known about how to reconnect families today because of DNA testing, which wasn't available back in the um, early 80s when Tomas, my fictional character Tomas, is looking for his family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think, a lot of things about that time period that really helped to to advance the story. Um, yeah. And, and one thing would be the uh, the lack of both internet and cell phones. Right, right. That was an adjustment to have to rethink those times and, yeah. and the ideas of phone books and, you know, um, maps and things like that, as opposed to the internet and the computer and Google Maps. And a lot of my research, I had to look on the internet to try to calculate time and distance and miles in terms of how I describe my setting. And... Um, and I did make two trips to Washington, D.C. to try to um, make my setting as realistic as possible. I've never been to the Franklin Institute, which I describe in the book, um, or the or Gettysburg, or Buenos Aires. But those were all things because of having the Internet that I was able to sort of fabricate as best I could. Right. Yeah. And it's it's interesting whenever I read books that are set not that far in the past, you know, within my own lifetime and remembering some of the things that we took for granted then um, or didn't realize was an issue, you know, like meeting someone in a busy place. Now we just call them. Right. Or text them. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. But trying to find someone, you know, if you get separated in Washington, D.C., it was not that easy then. No, no. Yeah. The fact that they use microfiche to look up old news <laughs> or Oh, microfiche. Good times. Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit more about Lee and Tomas as as characters and what about them, both individually and together, might resonate with readers? Yeah. Um, Lee is an autodidact. He's self-taught. He's, he's homeschooled, um, but he's alone a lot because his mother is at work. So she's hired Tomas to be his sort of caretaker as he's... Um, you know, becoming less and less mobile as his joints and heart and um, overall body ages. People who have progeria often die from a heart attack or stroke um, because they're the equivalent of, you know, someone in in his or her 80s, late 80s. So, um, so Lee is self-taught. He, I paired him with um, Ben Franklin as well because Lee has a very inventive sense of humor and he's precocious and he he's curious about everything. He loves American history because it's something he can't dispute. So much of his life is precarious and uncertain and he's drawn to American history because it's factual and it exists and he, he knows it happened. And then the idea of Ben Franklin and his quirky sense of humor is also very appealing to Lee and um, ben Franklin becomes sort of Lee's invisible confidant um, before he before he really meets Tomas. So I established Lee's character as sort of being a precocious learn, loner, um, uh, inventive, having an eccentric sense of humor, and and that was sort of his profile. And then when he meets Tomas, he's very suspicious of Tomas and doesn't believe that they'll ever be friends. There's a lot of friction between them at first and they're sort of at odds with one another. But when um, Lee's mother, Cass, cannot take Lee on the his sort of wish list journey to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, he has no choice but to, um, to go with Tomas and that feels like a risk to him. But in the end, what they really learn is they learn to love one another um, 
Tomas has lost his child. Lee doesn't have a father. His father left the family. So they sort of find a lot of common ground for parts of their lives that are missing in the end. And in the end, they're very close. Um, but in the beginning, they have a lot of friction. Uh, he's not a major character, but talk a little bit more about Patrick and why uh, why Lee has a potbelly pig as a companion. Well, um, it is kind of funny. Um, the potbelly pig is there, sort of the way the fool works in Shakespeare for some comic relief. Um, and I actually um, met a farmer and his pig on Martha's Vineyard, where I go in the summer, um, off the coast of Massachusetts. And I went to the agricultural fair and I met a farmer and his Vietnamese potbelly pig. And I just was very amused by that relationship. And it seemed like a like the pig was a real companion. So um, so not only for comic relief for Lee, but also to add interest and quirkiness, um, which seems to pair well with Lee's personality. And then it's also, um, you know, you would think the story would be very dark between a child who's dying of progeria and a man who was a torture victim and is missing his wife and child. But um, the story was never dark to me. It always felt like I was hopeful for my characters. And I think giving Lee Patrick, the pot-bellied pig, is just part of that sort of way in which he distracts himself from from darkness and and his, his, you know the inevitability of his fate and um, sort of lightens lightens his load a little bit in life. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You've, you've talked a little bit about research, but was there something that you had to research for the story that maybe was unexpected or something that you weren't that you weren't really expecting to have to research for this particular book? Well, there were a lot of things like I, I learned a lot more about Ben Franklin's inventions, um, not just the lightning rod, but, you know, he invented swim fins, which was an odd uh, thing. And he, he started the first public um, fire station and um, library. And there were a lot of things like that. But I did also learn a lot about the abuelas, the grandmothers and mothers in Argentina who um, whose children had been abducted and they um, march, they continue to march every Thursday afternoon at three o'clock in the Plaza de Mayo in um, Buenos Aires, which is the city plaza. And I learned a lot about them and their habits and, and how they joined together and sort of created an underground network um, for mothers and grandmothers to try to find their missing children. Because what happened in, during the dirty war is that um, pregnant mothers who were pregnant, women who were pregnant, um, who had been abducted off the street for very simple crimes that were considered, considered to be subversive. Like there was a student who worked on a, a college newspaper who wrote things against the government and she was one of the people who was abducted. But anyway, the mothers, once the babies were born, the babies were immediately taken away and were adopted by the military higher ups and the mothers were loaded into a plane and pushed out of the plane over the ocean near Uruguay. There were a lot of things like that that I learned that I hadn't been aware of. Um, and it was, it was, you know, these were very real situations with horrible crimes against humanity. And those were, those were hard to learn, but they were necessary in terms of anything else that was really strange, not really strange, but just, you know, creating a world in a novel, you have, I was really accountable for all of my facts. I didn't have a fact checker. I, I didn't know Spanish. I had to ask a Spanish speaking friend for help with the translation for a lot of things. Um, so there was just a lot of ground to cover. I wouldn't say strange, but I would say wide. I would say it was a, like a wide canvas to cover in terms of getting everything right. Mm -hmm. And let's go ahead and take our second break of this episode. More, of course, with Donna when we come back. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that... Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Donna Gordon. We're talking about her debut novel, What Ben Franklin Would Have Told Me. And before the break, Donna was talking about some of the research that she did, particularly research surrounding uh, the dirty war in Argentina before the book takes place and during the time that the book takes place. So let's go ahead and return now to that interview. One thing I like about... um, books that even even not that far back like this one is you know 40 years or so um is that uh i knew about i knew some things about the dirty war in argentina i knew what the abuelas were i'd heard of them but when you read a book like this while it's fiction it really gives you more insight into something that you maybe you maybe have never heard of or you only know a little bit about and it it personalizes it humanizes it um so that's something for me personally that i appreciate about well, I'm glad. Yeah, I mean, they had the World Cup going on in Argentina at the same time that people were being um, prodded with electrical prods and tortured and and killed. You know, so a lot of things happened behind the scenes, and people weren't aware of that reality. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. How about characters? When when you sit down to write, do you have a really good sketch of the characters in your um, head already or do you like to develop them more as you write or is it a combination for you I think it's a com oh I'm sorry I think it's a combination um I didn't really know my characters until they started to develop and interact together and then I sort of let them take over you've probably heard other writers say this that the characters sort of take charge even though the author is writing it mm-hmm. but you sort of learn to yield to the character you're creating and, and, you know, find that character's best interests and motivation. Um, my process for writing the novel, um, the, the image I sort of had in my mind is I was going down a long corridor and there were doors on other side, on either side of that corridor. And so the scenes, sorry, the scenes sort of emerged. I would open a door and go into one of those rooms and look around and notice as much as I could and write that and then come back out and go down the corridor and then maybe open a door on the opposite side and go in there and do the same thing and create a scene. Um, And the characters developed as they went on. You know, I didn't really know that Tomas and Lee were going to go on the journey right away. I didn't know they were going to become friends. Um, I only sort of knew that Lee wasn't going to survive in the end. And I just didn't know how I was going to get there. But what I discovered along the way, I really discovered his humanity and his humility and his ambitions and who he was inside. And I think of all the characters in the book, I'm probably mostly, I mean, I'm all the, I'm all the characters. I'm a mother. I have two sons. I was able to write Lee's mother's Cass's role from, from my experience as a mother, but um, I think the heart of the book for me is definitely Lee's character and who he is and and his struggle and, and how he deals with that in a sort of uh, humorous, inventive way. So it taught me something about myself, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about people who might read this book, do you have a specific hope for what they might take away from it? Yeah, I mean, I think I've gotten a lot of feedback um, 
And I think people are moved. I think they're moved by the kind of raw emotion that gets brought about and, and the sort of the humanity that the characters show for one another, the compassion. Um, I, I just, I, a lot of, you know, it, it's an adult literary novel, but um, I just received an award called the Whirling Prose Prize, which was um, given to me by Etchings Press, which is a student run um, publishing group at the University of Indianapolis. So it was college students who chose my book and we had a, um, a Zoom meeting and there, I think there were about eight students and each of them spoke very, very thoughtfully about how the book affected them and, and how um, they thought it was important and the characters and relationships. And so I was pretty moved by that to know that um, they felt something for the story. I guess what I feel, what I'm, what I feel most is that the book sort of stands alone. It stands apart from me. And even though I wrote it, it sort of exists in its own part. And I, I like that, you know, people react to it as a sort of living thing. Congratulations on the award. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. I was very impressed that you said whirling prose prize <laughs> without really having to think about it because I had to <laughs> I know it's a tongue twister. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I like the way it sounds, but I have to think about it very carefully. Yeah. I also, um, I received a starred Kirkus review, which I understand is hard to come by. Um, and it's, you know, for me as an older writer and, and still, you know, finally getting the book out, taking chances, it's, it's, I feel like the chances were worth taking. And I feel like um, people are, they're not reacting to me, they're reacting to the book and the story and the characters. And that is something I feel pretty good about because like I said, it does exist apart from me. And I, even though I wrote it, I'm not thinking about that part so much. I'm thinking about the part that people are responding to the story. This is your debut novel, which is great. Are you working on anything now? I am. I'm working on um, a collection of short stories. It's called Lesser Saints. And um, so far, uh, six of the stories have been published. I have eight in the collection, but I'm trying to um, add probably about four more stories. One of them might be a novella. I'm not sure I'm working on a longer story. And then I also started another novel. So, um, so yeah, I have stuff to do. You do. And you write in different um, different genres, not the word I'm looking for, I apologize, but you write poetry, you write, uh, th this is a novel, now you're writing short stories. Do you find each of them challenging in their own way? Do you have a preference for what you write? I really like the expansiveness of writing a novel. I like the fact that you could, that one could, you know, go off a little bit on a tangent, but make it relevant and make it fit. Um, and then you could cut back um, as needed. It's a very expansive sort of canvas. Um, and I also like the idea that it has a, a bigger shape. With the short stories, you can get away with writing a story that um, is more of a fragment in some ways. It's less complete. I mean, it's complete, but it could be more language driven. It could end on a sort of pause. It doesn't necessarily need to resolve um, through action, it can resolve through uh, sort of a, a an emotion that you are left with. So it's a different experience, um, at least the way I write stories. Some of them are, you know, more poetic, more prose poems. So you can you can do things a little differently with a story than um, than with a novel. Um, I don't really write poetry anymore because my language is already poetic, it sort of has been absorbed into longer sentences. Um, but one of the things I also do is I'm a visual artist. So I, um, I started doing some drawing and painting and printmaking. And that's something um, I find that there's a good overlap between the visual and the verbal doing both those things. Yeah, absolutely. Writing is something that you've done for a long time. But um, 
what gave you that final push to decide to write for publication? Well, I came close. I mean, I, I came close with my first novel called Cave Paintings that um, I was asked to rewrite by a few different editors. And then eventually they, they did not publish it. But um, I think, and then I, I had my family and I had, um, I was freelancing for the Boston Globe magazine. I was writing nonfiction and some short stories. But what really uh, persisted in me is what I call the music of language. I felt that there was something in me that really wanted to write and express in language and that I wasn't done. And so I, I sort of reopened that part of myself and just needed to keep going. And I'm glad I did. It's been difficult. You know, it's hard to publish something. Uh, my novel was published unagented by Regal House. It came close. Um, I had an agent a while ago and she didn't succeed in selling it. And then I started to approach smaller publishers and Regal House, uh, the editor there, Janie Royal, she read my book. She said she loved it. I decided just to go ahead because there had been too many near misses. And um, I, I feel like having published this novel, I've gone from being a writer to being an author. And that is very significant, even though it sounds subtle. Um, I feel like I I took the steps to move the book out into the world. And that, that has made quite a difference for me because um, it, it's not something that's left hanging anymore. It's something I feel I was able to complete. And I've um, given a lot of readings. I was asked to um, be part of the Boston Book Festival and the, a bunch of other things. And, I'm, you know, I feel like it sort of moved me into a different realm. So it was it was worth all the trouble. And let's go ahead and take our final break of this episode. When we come back, Donna will be giving her advice for aspiring authors. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Donna Gordon. Out of that experience, and you touched on this a little bit um, in your intro, but out of your own experience, what advice would you give for aspiring authors? I'd say there are no shortcuts. I'd say that revision is equal in value to writing. One has to be willing to do the work, to shape something, to imagine. I have some friends who write, but they're only writing something that's true to an experience they already had. You have to be willing to depart from those kinds of experiences and put things into the realm of the imagination and shape things for the sake of a story. So I would say um, one needs to be bold and strong and take risks and, and try to write characters that you feel. A lot of it, I think, I think a lot of the success of the characters in my book is because I really uh, let myself feel what they might have been experiencing. And I think one has to take the time to go there in each character and examine those feelings 
and try to write them as best as one can and get inside that deeply. So um, not to go on and on, but I think it's, it's a lot about being true to oneself. It's a lot about being willing to revise and reshape and think about story in different ways. You might think about it in one way to begin with, but you have to be willing to think about it differently as it develops. When you take the time to read for yourself, um, what are your favorite genres and who are your favorite authors? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, I really like Michael Andante, who wrote The English Patient. Um, he also wrote a memoir that I love that I don't know if many people know about. It's called Running in the Family. He grew up in Sri Lanka. And this is like a really beautiful lyrical um, memoir. Um, I like Flannery O'Connor, um, Chekhov, Louise Erdrich. Um, I love Barbara Kingsolver's prologue to um, Poisonwood Bible. Um, that's a beautiful piece of writing. Um, I love um, Cormac McCarthy. There was a book uh, written by um, um, Atticus Lish, uh, the son of Gordon Lish, the editor who passed away. Uh, but Atticus Lish wrote a novel called Preparation for the Next Life, which is an amazing book. I really like that. I like Dennis Johnson's fiction. Um he wrote a collection of stories called Jesus' Son and some novels. Um, I tend to like literary fiction. Um, so there's there's a lot, probably too much to mention. But um, but those are some of my top writers. Uh, Marilyn Robinson, who wrote a book called Housekeeping um, back in the 80s. That was a beautiful book. Again, they're, the ones that I focus on the most are literary fiction Mm -hmm. Asking authors to list their favorite authors is kind of is kind of mean, actually, because we, wow. <laughs> there's always so many. But I can I can tell I'm not familiar with every author that you listed, but I can definitely tell that you tend to read um, books, that, uh, authors that have kind of that same relationship with the words that I think you have. Yeah, I sort of that sort of comes alive for me when I connect connect with them. I just read. Um, Horse by um, oh God, blanking on her name too. Anyway, um, I'm pretty open actually to reading most things, um, but the ones that resonate more are the ones that are pretty inventive with language. Sure, absolutely. How about um, internet presence, a website if you have one, and any uh, social media that you are active on? Yeah, I um I tend to post a lot on Instagram because I I post uh, not only my news about writing but also my uh, visual art and my um, Instagram handle is Donna Gordon eight nine nine four and you'll see I have a lot of my art posted there um, as well. I'm on Facebook Donna S Gordon. I don't really use um, Twitter that much. I do have a website that people might be interested in. It's just called, it's DonnaSGordon.com. And um, I have the homepage is filled with news about the novel. And then there is a visual art tab. If people are interested, they can click on that and see um, the different kinds of art I've been making. I am represented by a gallery in Boston. I think I might've mentioned that. I'm gonna have a, um, a solo show uh, in February here at Galatea Fine Art. Um, I don't really like social media. I don't feel like I can keep up with it that well, but um, but I definitely feel like I want to let people know about the book. And so I do post things there. Right. Yeah. No, social media is a, a beast entirely unto itself. <laughs> yeah. It's a time suck. Absolutely. It's a time suck and it, it can make you feel sort of uncomfortable if everybody's, you know, posting their best moments and you're not having your best day and you're kind mm -hmm. of like seeing, you know, somebody's shining smile um, where they've won the lottery or something, you know, you sort of sort of pull back a little bit. I completely understand. Um, 
So Donna, we've covered a variety of things during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight? Um, I think it's amazing that there are readers in the world, you know, in this day and age when so many people are, are not reading and are on, on, you know, using technology. So I want to thank people for taking the time to listen to this podcast and to think about my book. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything. If anyone wants to contact me directly, um, I've been going both both on Zoom and in person to several book groups, um, which has been really interesting. And I enjoy doing that. And I'm going to go to a school um, and I've done some radio programs. So I think, um, yeah, I'm just growing with the role of being an author. And I hope to encourage other writers, no matter who they are or where they're at with their careers, to just keep going because it does make a difference to bring your work into the public world. It's, it's validating and it sort of pushes you along in a way that's very valuable. So I encourage others, you know, to keep going with their work. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you also for taking the time to talk to me, not only about your debut novel, but writing and um, so many other topics. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. It was really fun. And I'm so glad you're doing this. You're doing a real service to readers and writers. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And I know we ended with me saying thank you to Donna, but I always say thank you at this point, regardless of the fact that I just thanked her for her kind words. Uh, now I say thank you again to Donna for joining me to talk about her debut novel. I really appreciate it. As you know, if you are a regular listener, I appreciate so much, not only all of you, my listeners, but also all of the authors who come and share a little bit about themselves and their work with me in the time that we have together. I'm just very appreciative of everyone that is a part of this podcast, whether it is the authors I speak to or you, the listeners who make it possible to keep going with this. So thank you to you. Thank you, especially today to Donna for talking to me. If you are looking for um, a new book to read and maybe you are a fan of American history or maybe you like relationships, uh, books about relationships, then this is something that you should look into. It is not always, I don't want to say it's not always a happy book. I mean, there's some, there's some heavy topics in here, right? I mean, Tomas and Lee are both dealing with very difficult things happening in their life, as is Cass. I don't know about Patrick, he seems pretty content, <laughs> but, but the, really, the, the characters are dealing with very hard things in their life. But while there are hard topics that are dealt with. This is really a book that always seeks the hope. It is always looking for the joy in situations. And you see that especially with Lee and his love for history and the way his relationship develops with Tomas and his relationship with his mother and Patrick and Kira, who is Donna said, does die at the beginning of the book, um, is Lee's best friend, but we still see glimpses of the relationship that he had with Kira before he, she died and how that relationship changed him. The relationships in this book have a profound effect on the characters, and so if that is something that you like in your novels, then you should definitely check this one out, or if you are... Um, looking to buy a gift for someone in your life who loves to read, then this might be something that you want to check out as well. So thank you, Donna. Thank you to you, my, my listeners. I hope you will join me next time when I will be speaking with author Scott Russell Sanders about his novel, Small Marvels. So join me for that. Hopefully it'll be another wonderful conversation. In the meantime, I hope you have something fun planned for the weekend. I am just hoping to sleep in. <laughs> My dogs won't let me sleep in, but they might let me then go back to sleep. We'll see. At any rate, um, whatever your plans for the weekend are, you know what I'm about to say next. And actually, 
you know what I'm about to say next, even though I'm not going to say what I was about to say. I'm going to say the thing that I normally say before the thing I was about to say, and that is, if you are a fan of this podcast, please do me the favor of um, a few things, if you haven't done so already, and that is like, subscribe, follow on whatever podcast platform you listen to the podcast on. That way you'll always know when there are new episodes. Uh, For instance, sometimes they come out on Fridays and sometimes uh, most of the time they come out on Tuesdays, but every once in a while we have a Friday episode. You don't want to miss that. And then also uh, a review would be wonderful, just like you review the books that you read, hopefully, and help those authors out. A review can help get this podcast out to more listeners like yourselves. And then, of course, I mentioned social media before um, when we were talking about Friday the 13th. Please, if you don't do so already, come find the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And I love hearing from readers. Tell me what you've been reading. Tell me what your 2023 reading goals are, all of that good stuff. And now, whatever you have planned for this weekend, you know what I'm about to say next. And that is, I hope that you have plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book or 10. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program